Oi! Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Tapiero, co-founder of Gold Bullion International and founder of DTAP Capital. And today, I'm here with an old friend, I think a very special guest for Real Vision, Tom Kaplan. Tom is the chairman of the Electrum Group. He's also chairman of Nova Gold. And I would say that of any person that I know, uh, Tom really is the living embodiment of the Renaissance man. Tom has distinguished himself in many different areas. And one of the most interesting, and one that I would like to start with, is his passion for conservation and the conservation of the big cats. And Tom, I'd like you to start to talk about Panthera. Panthera was created in 2006. Uh, by my wife Daphne and myself and the late Alan Rabinowitz, who I would say was the brother that I never had. In fact, I think it's fair to say that we both felt that way about each other. And in many ways, we came to uh, fulfill each other's lives and passion in an unusual way. When I was a boy, I wanted to become what essentially Alan Rabinowitz became, a big cat biologist, and wildlife conservationist. Around the age of eight or nine, I discovered a genuine aptitude for history. And it was that which I pursued all the way through my education. And if anything, the application of history has been the greatest relative advantage that I've had in my business and in my philanthropy. Because I understood the nature of cycles, I was able to um, make um, a very good living in the mining industry and in the energy sector. And that allowed me to go back to my first love. I'd always said that if I had the good fortune to make a fortune, I would go back and retrace my steps and support those who really did have a genuine aptitude for science and for being able to apply science in the interests of environmental preservation. When I met Alan, I realized that in many ways, my mission was being fulfilled by being able to leverage the wealth that I had created through investing and creating companies and enabling those great conservationists to go out and save the species I loved. And that's how Panthera was created. And over the course of the next decade, we became the leading NGO, a non-government organization, in big cat conservation, getting to the point where National Geographic described us as the most comprehensive effort in big cat conservation ever. And the US government said, if Panthera can't save the cats, then nobody can. Now, when was that? That was several years ago. And we've taken that mission extremely seriously. We're the only organization dedicated to the conservation of all the wild cats, from the smallest through to the Amur tiger. And it's something which I would say of all my passions that you referenced, um, this one is the closest to my heart. I genuinely believe that the greatest psychic gratification that someone can have is to prevent a species from blinking out in their lifetimes. And I know that we've had that kind of effect. We've been able to move the needle in tigers, jaguars, snow leopards, leopards, lions. And this means everything to me. I want to know that we've made a difference in leaving the planet itself in better condition than the way that we found it, which is extremely rare because after all, the human being is a parasite. I mean, we take from our host, we don't give anything back to it. Usually the most that we can imagine doing is to do as little harm as possible. But what was the, what was the specific inspiration for the big cats as opposed to other species that are endangered? No doubt, when I was a child, the primary impulse was the appreciation of 
their beauty, their majesty, their elegance. There's a reason why big cats and small cats, um, by small I mean the small wild cats, have such an impact on people. They immediately create empathy when someone looks at them. Hmm. And this is extremely important mm -hmm. because we've done studies which have shown that in most countries, certainly in the Western world, of the top dozen terrestrial animals, um, seven or eight of those that immediately create the most immediate sense of empathy are indeed the cats. Oh. So what does this allow us to do? Well, hmm. if you're an environmentalist, if you're interested in wildlife conservation, it allows you to leverage the iconic nature of the cats to be able to provide a hook on which those who really want to engage in conservation can hang their hats. Not only because of the beauty, not only because um, that kind of refinement is clearly something that transcends race, class, gender, creed, but also because from a biological standpoint, it's the ideal creature with which to be able to affect landscape-wide conservation. We call cats the umbrella species, almost always within their landscape. The big cats are what you would call the charismatic megafauna, or the umbrella species, or the apex predator. And if you think of the ecosystem as a pyramid with the apex predator at the top, and then all the way down to the ground and the landscape itself, then what you find is that the big cats require two essential ingredients in which to thrive, land, in which to roam, and protein. If an ecosystem, by definition, can support a thriving population of big cats, it's a healthy ecosystem hmm. because it provides an entire food chain. So if you want to save critical habitats, critical ecosystems, landscapes, hmm. the best way to do is to focus on the cats. So from a uh, practical standpoint, from a pragmatic standpoint, the cats have a uh, tremendous function in wildlife conservation. And we know that there are vast landscapes around the world that exist today because of the work that we've done to ensure that the cats have an ecosystem that can sustain them. So the, uh, I know you've worked on the uh, Jaguar yes. Corridor. Could you talk a little bit about that, let people know what you've done there? The Jaguar Corridor was conceived of and implemented by uh, Dr. Alan Rabinowitz, our partner in creating Panthera. It is far and away the most ambitious carnivore conservation program ever undertaken. And the mission is uh, almost breathtaking in its scope, in its ambition. It's to create um, or to identify a genetic corridor all the way through the Jaguar's range from the Sonora in Mexico, all the way down through Central America into South America, into Guyana in the north, and ultimately reaching northern Argentina. Something that's extraordinary about the Jaguar is that from Mexico to Argentina, it's the same genetics. There are no subspecies along the way, which means that the populations haven't become isolated that presents us with a tremendous opportunity. And the basic principle of the corridor is that having identified this genetic pathway, we work with governments who sign on to implementing their, de their development plans in a way that's consistent with enabling the mm. jaguar to pass. Because by definition, there are jaguars crossing the Panama Canal, hence they're not genetically isolated and creating subspecies. So the program itself is a really beautiful example of applied science and applying rigorous science to conservation. So I know that the, I think I was reading somewhere that the tigers are the ones that right now are the most uh, threatened. Uh, what is the thought as to maybe creating a corridor for the tigers? 
Uh, is that something that uh, Panthera is focusing on? Is that a, what is being done specifically? The concept of corridors and tiger conservation, because those populations have become so isolated, mm. is uh, very hard to implement. You can have corridors in relatively small areas. So the idea uh, behind the Jaguar corridor, for example, we could no longer implement in tigers on a relative basis, tigers are in triage. So it's more along the lines of what we would call a stronghold strategy, okay. which is find those areas where you have that critical mass of land, of prey density, and protect them as strongholds so that within those areas, the tigers are secure. Hmm. And it's this kind of work that Panthera and its partners are affecting throughout the tigers range. But we're not able to play offense with tigers in the same way as mm -hmm. we can do that with jaguars. Jaguars still allow us to be in a position to think forward and to be proactive in a way that with tigers, it's just much more difficult. Is there a specific project that, I don't wanna say is your favorite, but is there one that you could tell the audience about uh, that you know, moved you to a certain degree more than the others? I became very keen, obviously, on the Jaguar Corridor. Okay, yeah. Because it meshed with my own temperament, which is um, big landscape, um, take advantage of momentum, um, and be able to apply strategies more akin to Blitzkrieg than to trench warfare. But what does that mean exactly? Uh, what it means is that in the case of the Jaguar, because we can work with governments to be proactive mm -hmm. and save landscapes that still exist and are not yet the patchwork quilt that would more characterize the tiger's landscape, it allows us to be bold in a way that with tigers, it's harder. So the difference between um, being able to capture a flag through the Jaguar corridor and to hold a fortress in Tigers Forever, for example, um, it's a different kind of mentality. We have to do both. Our attitude has always been whatever it takes, um, different cats have different challenges. They're very, very, very dissimilar in many respects. So one intermediate case, for example, which we began yeah. called Project Leonardo, which um, Leonardo means the courage of a lion, also happens to be my older boy's um, first name. Um, but Project Leonardo was meant to try to replicate the Jaguar corridor in Africa. And unfortunately, we found that whereas there are a few places where they could implement that, in fact, it's a hybrid. Um, there are now strongholds for lions in much the same way as is happening for tigers. The only difference is because anyone who goes on a safari and any photographer who wants to take pictures of a lion can see them. They're gregarious. Um, they allow themselves to be seen. Um, they are, travel in numbers. You can spot them during the day. So everyone goes and sees lions. Uh, or reports back that they've seen lions, and they mm -hmm. make the assumption that the lion is in good shape. Whereas in reality, the lion is going the way of the tiger. The lion is going the way of the elephant. Hmm. Um, I gave an interview over the summer when um, the, uh, the live action version of The Lion King um, came out, and yeah. we pointed out that lion populations have fallen by 50% since the 1990s wow. when the Lion King, the animated version originally came out. Mm -hmm. So we, there we are applying some of the corridor techniques, but usually more and more within a landscape. So not quite a stronghold beyond a stronghold, but it's a struggle. It's a struggle with lions. And would you say that's the biggest hurdle you think you face just within the, uh, organization's goals for the future is it's lions, tigers, but is there a bigger hurdle that you feel you face? In some respects, the biggest hurdle that we face 
but I do sense that that's beginning to change, oh. is that um, we've really needed more great scientists like Alan Rabinowitz. Mm -hmm. um, who passed away recently. Exactly, yeah. but mm -hmm. who left behind um, a cohort of dozens of people who were inspired by him and received training from him or through his tutelage. And so in terms of the conservationists themselves, the people in the field, they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. And very early on, we were um, thinking about the future. And I'm a big believer in that old adage, if you're going out in search of Moby Dick, take the tartar sauce. In other words, plan for victory. And so we created um, cadres of wildlife conservationists on the grounds that if we build it, they will come. It's taken longer to be able to put together the coalition of philanthropists mm. that I would hope to have seen. I thought that soon after we created Panthera, the iconic nature of the cats, as well as seeing someone step up um, with um, very large ambitions and a very large willingness to um, give resources, um, would inspire people to our banner very quickly. It's taken more time. We have now Indian collaborators, Chinese. We will have more Americans who are joining us. Um, and very importantly, um, we found that one of the greatest sources of passion for big cat conservation, and it's absolutely sincere, um, has emerged from the Arab Gulf. Hmm. And beginning with my strategic partner, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, and now uh, having been joined by uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, Prince Badr, the culture minister and the governor of Al Ula, with the blessing of the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, um, the leopard now has a champion. And that funding is going to be used not only to reintroduce one of the subspecies of leopards into Saudi wow. Arabia, wow. Arabian leopard, but also to advance leopard conservation globally. The leopard has the widest range of all the big cats, but it's also the most persecuted of the big cats. So ironically, despite the fact that we all know that leopard is one of the most ubiquitous features in the fashion world, people don't know that it's um, becoming endangered and in certain cases critically endangered. Um, we embrace the fact that people wear leopard. We think that that's a very, very good sign. Nobody wears real leopard. And to the extent that we do find um, in parts of Africa, for example, where people are wearing real leopard, we created a program, which really is very dear to my heart, called Furs for Life, in which having identified that there was a strong decline in leopard populations in Southern Africa and tracing that um, to the rise of a, um, a church um, and in, in, a, in a tribal context in South Africa, we worked with the tribal leaders to replace um, or to otherwise preempt their followers wearing leopard capes and replace them with capes that we designed, had made in China, and brought in. And that program in and of itself has saved thousands of leopards. Arguably, oh, wow. it's saved more big cats than any other big cat conservation program for any species at any time. So when you look at things like this and you, you talk about the challenges, sure, we know that in many ways we're behind the eight ball. But then again, as we like to say, nature needs wins and when you get down sometimes, when it appears like it's going to be too hard in certain places, then you have a win and you're reminded that you can play offense. You're reminded that you can make an enormous difference. It was a very creative uh, response. Well, I credit very our creative. team in yeah. uh, South Africa. Um, it's now run by actually the first um, of the awardees of our educational grants, Guy Balm, who's our leopard expert and who just returned from um, Saudi Arabia, mm. where with our CEO, Fred Launay, um, we are implementing 
what we hope will be the gold standard in captive breeding and reintroduction. So you have other interests in conservation as well. I know at your alma mater, uh, Oxford, you've uh, funded a project. Could you tell us about that? Again, on the principle that if you're going to go all in, assume that you will have success. And the reason I say that is because managing success can often be a lot harder than managing decline. Managing growth um, is harder than managing atrophy. Less depressing, perhaps, more exhilarating. Nothing, nothing to do. <laughs> but when you grow, it's like an army. Um, when it breaks through the front, you have to make sure that your logistics are well attended. Otherwise, you become too far ahead of your supplies, which are awkward moments. In that same spirit, believing that we would have an impact on the cats and believing that one day we would be where we are today, operating in 50 countries with 100 partnerships, we endowed uh, the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit, mm -hmm. the wild crew um, at Oxford University in order to be able to uh, create the largest and most comprehensive field focused university-based conservation program. And uh, not soon after, um, we have seen that it works. Uh, very shortly after we created uh, the program of bringing in conservationists from around the world, from the developing world, to get training and best practices where they were returned. It's now known as the Sandhurst of Wildlife Conservation. Oh. <laughs> and it won the Queen's Anniversary Prize for Innovation and Education. On a more somber note, it also became very famous because um, there was a uh, viral moment in lion conservation which was created when a dentist from Minnesota shot um, oh, yeah. an iconic lion named Cecil yeah. in Hwangi National Park in Zimbabwe. We knew Cecil by name because it was that program which caused us to be interested in Oxford in the first place. So we took it very personally. But more importantly, um, when Jimmy Kimmel made an impassioned uh, plea for the lion a day or two later, the influx of interest into Wild Crew and Oxford University was so intense that it caused the entire computer system to break down for the first time in its history. <laughs> We're very proud that we caused that um, wardrobe misfunction. But the truth is that this program has been extremely successful. I'm particularly grateful to Julian Robertson. Oh, and yeah. The Robertson I, Foundation. My old boss, I, I remember hearing about his involvement. Yeah, Tiger, the Tiger Fund. Julian's been a big supporter. Big supporter. Julian yeah. has been a big supporter of Panthera. He's mm -hmm. been our largest supporter in tiger conservation. And he has very much been my partner in creating. Um, the endowment for Wild Crew. It's a beautiful thing when people give back to those uh, creatures that don't have royalties hmm. for the usage of their image or, right. or their name. They would be huge if they did, no right? No question I mean, about it. I mean, yeah. Disney did give us some funding, oh. but I would call it more a first step along the path to getting the kind of funding we need to save the lion. But Julian has been um, the most generous supporter mm. in tiger conservation um, in the world. Oh, I'm incredibly grateful goodness. to him and the foundation and mm. the family. So as you said in conservation, it's important to have winners. And uh, you've experienced having many winners in the business world and spe specifically in natural resources. Let's talk a little bit about your early forays into the natural resources uh, investment world. Like many of the best experiences that I've had, um, my engagement in investing in natural resources and starting companies happened purely by chance. Oh. Well, I have no background in geology or in engineering, but nonetheless, I found myself in a situation where I was advising a um, hedge fund manager named Avi Tiomkin, 
who was in turn advising Michael Steinhardt and the late oh. Jack Nash, mm -hmm. Odyssey Partners. And having had success in being able to translate an understanding of geopolitics and how that could be superimposed onto commodities and having also, as my doctorate, studied the interrelationship between commodities and strategic planning, Mm -hmm. um, I had a natural affinity for natural resources. Mm -hmm. Around 1993, purely by chance, because we would look at the price of gold and silver as anecdotal indicators for bigger macro themes, yeah. I started to look at silver, which was then trading at three and a half dollars an ounce. And my analysis suggested that whereas the zeitgeist was that silver would fall to a more normalized $2 because digital uh, would supplant silver halide film and taking a third of demand ostensibly from any commodity should cripple it. My view was that people didn't understand the true economics of what was going on in silver and that it had a better chance of returning to the bunker hunt days mm. of $50 than to going down to two. Yeah, but why, what, it was just an asymmetric bet? What was the, the main driver there? Mythology is a wonderful thing, and it's been one of my great uh, privileges to have debunked a few myths along the way in the last 25 years. The myth about silver film was that it represented a third of demand, whereas in reality, on a net basis, it represented maybe three or four percent of demand. Why do I say that? By the mid 90s, technology was such that 90 percent of the silver that was in silver film was recycled and returned onto the market as the second largest source of silver supply. Mm -hmm. So the real loss of demand, even if it were to go away immediately, wouldn't be a third, but about 10 to 15% of a third, whereas there was already a systemic supply-demand disequilibrium between 10 and 20% in silver, and inventories, which had peaked over a billion ounces um, in the early 1980s, were plunging by 100 to 200 million ounces a year. <clears throat> At some point, we'd reach an inflection. Silver would stabilize and return to an uptrend. On that basis, I created my first company. Um, I used money that I'd made on silver options. And um, having made a decision that I didn't want to watch the price of silver um, on any given day or to see where it was trading in Frankfurt or Tokyo, I thought, why don't I buy a silver mine that's closed down? And I'll use my proceeds that way, and that way I have a long-dated option. When I researched the subject, I found that there were a lot of shut down silver mines. Almost 90% of the underground mines in Mexico had been shut down, almost oh. all of them in Peru, Bolivia, the Coeur d'Alene district in Idaho. And I thought, there's an interesting play here. My initial assumption was that silver had to return to at least five and a half dollars because that was the break-even price for silver in the Coeur d'Alene district. And it did. It went to five and a half dollars. I had options wait, wait, and I made wait, some uh, money. Right. But, you know, as uh, actually having been involved in silver and gold at that time as well, it's one thing to make a great bet uh, on the market. It's another to actually strike silver in a mine. And I understand 90% were closed, but you picked the right one. Was there a specific light bulb that went off? What was the, I could have picked the wrong one. It's one of the virtues of ignorance that if you put your ego aside, bear markets not only yield um, interesting asset acquisition opportunities, but they also yield some of the most experienced um, practitioners. Ah, and so right. not only were assets available, yeah. but so were some of the greatest geologists in the world. And I was very blessed that early in my career, after mm -hmm. a year, 
um, I was joined by one of the greatest and most renowned exploration geologists, Dr. Larry Buchanan, and he joined me as my chief geologist. And he has been with me since 1994. Understood. That makes it very clear. Well, you know, yeah. the, the important thing yeah. is Having hire right people team. whose job yeah. is to tell you the emperor has no clothes. And I was the first to admit, I don't understand geology. I don't understand engineering. And candidly, I don't have a particular intellectual interest in it. But what I do love are geologists and engineers. And they fascinate me. Mm. And they're very down to earth, literally and figuratively. Yeah. And yeah. I love that. And for some reason, I have a, um, a better than average ability to listen to a story and determine which ones might work. Um, in the case of the, of the uh, silver, um, I created three companies, one focused on Mexico and Central America, another focused on Bolivia and uh, Peru, and another focused on Central Asia. And eventually we amalgamated them into one company, but um, on one property in Bolivia, not far from the great Potosi silver mines, um, Larry made a discovery in a place called San Cristobal, yeah. which was and remains one of the greatest silver discoveries in history, and uh, certainly of the last several hundred years. To be able to go out into the mining industry, where the odds of being able to find something like that have been variously estimated at between 1,000 to 1 and 10,000 to 1, that kind of luck begets more luck. But have no doubt, I do believe, and the geologists that I know who've made great careers, like Ross Beatty or Bob Quartermain, um, will all acknowledge that luck, la fortuna, um, is uh, the one thing that we've always been able to count on. Okay, you so never uh, take it for okay, granted. Okay, so what what inspired the the exit then? Because we all know you can be long uh, and have something go up, but if you don't get out at the right time, it's pointless. So, what was the inspiration for the exit? It's of Apex, right? Yeah. Apex still. Well, two things. First yeah. of all, I had taken it from a million dollar valuation mm -hmm. uh, when uh, the Soros family uh, and Jack Nash um, joined me in the investment. It had a valuation of 13 million. Within a decade, we were valued at over a billion. The company was larger than its four or five nearest comparables combined mm. because of the nature of the assets. Taught me a very good lesson. It's all about the assets. And it had gotten to the point where it came time to build the mine. Now, for years, I had tried to retire, but um, Quantum always said, please, please stay until after it's financed. So I did, and we financed the mine. And by that time, I was already exploring for platinum in Southern Africa mm -hmm. and had this weird idea to go into the energy business right? without ever having any background in energy so, either. So let's skip to that then. Let's skip to the energy. What was the inspiration for that movement? Um, well, I felt I'd been in that very movie rare, before. Right. But it's very rare to move from, you know, <laughs> mining and precious to energy um, almost, I don't know whether it was over a few months or whether it was a, a year. So there must have been some inspiration that made you believe there was an opportunity in the energy. My modus operandi is, or has been, I begin with an intuition. Mm. And then I see whether that intuition can be fleshed out into a thesis. Then I scrubbed the thesis to see whether it was baseless. Um, and if I can reality check it and come to the conclusion that I'm on the right track, then I tend to go all in. 
So you maintain your uh, roots to history uh, analysis and to all the study of history, right? It's the same process that one uses to make uh, an analysis of a historical period. Correct. It's the same that, thing. That, that's why I yeah. said at the outset, that's yeah. my relative advantage. Yeah. I've never taken a finance course, yeah. an economics course, or a business course. Right. I think that that would probably bore me to tears. But right. history may not repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And I felt that there was some rhyming going on in the oil space. And I remember oil was around $17, $18 a barrel. Right. The consensus was that oil would go back down to a more normative 12 to 15, maybe even under 10 again. And my analysis was that oil was going to 100. And so I named an energy company after my kids, mm -hmm. Lior Energy and went out in search of Moby Dick again. And again, got very lucky. And in East Texas, certainly an area um, in which oil was, or natural gas was unknown, um, a couple of very intrepid, um, experienced uh, geologists um, who were retired um, led by a man named John Amoruso, came to me with an idea. Oh, really? Mm. So it's that idea that in in deep bear markets, the talent also is available. Everything is available. So that was the, that was the feeling, the similar feeling to you, that everything was available, like you had Correct. in the silver. I, right, like a I deep told bear you, market. It wasn't repeating right. itself, but right. it was rhyming. Yeah. yeah. And the audacity of their belief hmm. that in East Texas, if one drilled deeper, you would encounter what's called a turbidite fan, effectively an offshore gas field rolled onshore, um, was extremely tempting to me. And I was feeling lucky. And I thought I'm young enough to uh, lose some serious money after having made some serious money. and put up the money to acquire all of the land for this play, which had been rejected by most of the majors as oh, being, yeah, really? they thought it was uh, fanciful, and drilled it without having an outside partner. And we hit, and the thesis was proven, both by our drilling and drilling done by a neighboring company called Burlington, mm -hmm. which was then acquired by a larger oil and gas company. When we proved that, the theory was right, we were approached by a Canadian independent in Canna. Yeah. And in Canna had done a lot of evaluation of all of the land in the area. They said they thought ours was the best. And they put up the equivalent um, in terms of commitments of about $150 million to earn a 30% stake in the company. Um, after paying another couple hundred million dollars more to go to 50%, in 2007, they paid 2.55 billion to buy out our 50%. That was in November of 2007. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of 2007, I had made a determination that things were too good in the world, and I would take the opportunity to exit anything that we had which was economically sensitive. So if something was gold or silver, fine. Platinum, not fine. Energy, definitely not fine. That was certainly not the conventional wisdom in early 2007. But you had other interests outside of the, uh, the oil and gas? I did. Into I, had, I, had, I, I effectively controlled a platinum company in South Africa called African Platinum. Oh, still, I see. And yeah, yeah. we sold that in the spring of 2007 mm -hmm. to Impala Platinum right? and the energy company in November. At that point, gold was around 600-ish, 6, 650. Um, energy had reached $120 a barrel and being somewhat disciplined, um, I knew that it was time to go. Um, also, in the August of that year, I became convinced that the financial system was a game of musical chairs. You may recall right, there was right. a moment when the system seized up and sure. everything went from all bid, no ask, to all ask, no bid. And that, to me, 
from an anecdotal standpoint, told me it was a game of musical chairs and I'd better be gone. And we decided we're going to sell the energy company. And fortunately, Ben Bernanke uh, obliged, lowered interest rates, stock right. market went to an all-time high, yeah. and we sold to Incana. They needed the asset because their plan was to uh, spin off or to split their company into oil sands and an EMP company with this as their flagship. We had the biggest onshore wells in the United States. So willing buyer, willing seller. Mm. I believed in gold and I wanted to be out of everything else. Right, so how did that happen exactly? I mean, the silver foray was early, not a gold foray, but I understood that you're a keen uh, observer of the macro, but the move into gold, what was the, was it a, a macro light bulb? Was it something you saw in the mining industry? What was the, the motivator, the driver? Because again, and I don't know if this was 07 or was it in 08 that you, it wasn't a very long period of time before you became very focused on gold, meaning the silver to the energy and then the energy back to the gold uh, was not a very long period of time. Not really. Right. Um, was but there a, they were for a, different reasons. Right. So there was an overall thesis that monetary metals are a good thing. And I knew how hard it was to find it. This is 0708. Um, or, well, this, this or just generally this, this really since went, silver. This, this really went back right. into the 90s. Yeah. Now, you are right. So I started a silver company because I was ambivalent on gold. My attitude was because of the fact that silver um, has a thousand industrial applications. It's mm. the most conductive of all metals, reflective, um, malleable, antibacterial, not to mention the fact that it is and has been throughout history, as Milton Friedman put it, um, the major monetary metal. Yeah. But for all of those reasons, I thought any reason to own gold were multiplied for silver. So I wouldn't bother with gold because I had all the attributes of the monetary metal yeah. with industrial applications that would always provide me with even more demand. By the time the financial crisis rolled around and we were in a position to pivot to a monetary metal, the first one was gold because I thought of gold as being the stock with silver as the warrant. So it was gold yeah. and silver, yeah. which is why the company that we created was called Electrum, which is right. in fact a naturally occurring alloy of gold and silver. And in fact, it is what composed the first coinage, which was invented in Lydia. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought the name was cool. Yeah. So um, creating Electrum, the idea was we'll focus on gold and silver. The passage of time taught me that so many of the fundamentals of gold were being underpinned by micro fundamentals. Um, the precariousness of the industry itself that I became more and more and more bullish on gold um, and silver. And our most important operations, certainly our flagships in the mining industry are in gold and silver. So what was the first step though, I'm thinking in that 07, 08, was there, it was an acquisition of a, of a, of a mine? Was it, uh, did, I don't know whether you ever take positions in the underlying or in the futures. I know you, you tend not to at all, but when you had that moment that, okay, gold uh, is going to be the next thing that I focus on, what was the first step you took? What, what did you acquire? The first step in gold was actually slightly earlier. In the early 2000s, um, gold had reached about $250 an ounce. Mm. And when gold was in the 300s, 400s, I started the exploration company called Electrum LTD. Oh, um, so it was started with, earlier. Yes, okay. with Larry Buchanan. And the uh -huh. focus was on gold exploration, mm -hmm. primarily in the developing world, um, primarily in Africa. 
And there was a point where I became the largest holder of mineral rights in the entire Islamic world, um, which for a nice Jewish boy named Kaplan um, was an unusual moment and a very good one for me because it sparked an interest to have a partner who might be able to give us uh, some backup um, in all of the countries that we were in from Mauritania through to Pakistan. Did you visit all those places? Almost Just out of interest. Oh yeah. Yeah, Mauritania. Yeah, yeah. So how many countries do you think you've been to? Because I know for, oh, I think the number was, you had property in 70 countries. Was that what it was? You had rights in, at one point, I can't remember. Um, that sounds a little but, high. Okay, but did um, you? I myself visited or have been. I mean, just out of interest, it seems like uh, about 110 countries. Oh, yeah, that's incredible. Makes for an interesting life. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of the, it's one of it's one of the virtues of uh, both being in this industry. But even then, without it, I try to inculcate in my children that the best way to understand what it means to be human is to actually go out and see the world. You know, also gold is really a world asset, you know, even more so than the dollar or any of the other assets. It's something, I think if you go into the smallest village uh, anywhere and you say gold, they know what that is. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it, I don't wanna say it unites everybody, but it definitely is the most global macro of, uh, of all the assets. On global macro, so let me fast forward a little bit uh, to today because we had that wonderful run into 2011-12. We had a consolidation for, let's call it six years within a $200 uh, range. And certainly in that period, I can remember having a few different coffees and lunches with you. And, you know, we were in the trenches there, uh, you know, me with my gold company, you in a much larger scale with yours. Where are we today, do you think? Uh, we've broken out of this six month range. The price is now 1450, it's been 1500. Is this the beginning, do you think, of a real bull run now, back to the old highs or higher? How are you thinking about it? The short answer is yes, but let me elaborate a little bit more. Yeah. I always allow for um, a substantial pullback um, during the course of a bull market. And there are aspects of the chart formation which are unbelievably powerful. And you're probably raising your eyebrow. Yeah, I just did. Uh, because <laughs> just you're, did. you're wondering I, I, I what, a, what, you what, what, what a historian is that, doing. Right, but right. And well, a history charts are a history. Bingo. Right. So but. anyone who doesn't understand charts or dismisses them, I think they're missing understanding human brain waves. Well, you should know that Julian, who we referenced before, was strongly anti-chart. So I'm just, you Unto know, thine but own then self other, be true. Oh, okay, you put it out there. I don't, I don't, tell, I don't tell other people right. how to run their business. Right. And I don't think anyone could teach me how to do things differently because at this point in my life, whatever yeah. I'm doing, yeah, yeah. it's enough. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine with it. Yeah. Um, the most important thing is, uh, to remain consistent. And I'm with you, I love the charts. Well, I, I, I think they tell a lost story. You know, I remember sitting with you and watching you wince when I was describing um, that gold was experiencing a declining wedge formation. Yeah. What I called the, <laughs> yeah. the correct, yeah, no, I mean, you burst into, into laughter <laughs> because it seems so incongruous yeah. coming yeah. from <laughs> someone who's so clearly fundamentally and data driven or even anecdotally driven. And deep in the mind. Yeah, <laughs> so, you know, we had this wonderful 12 years in which gold ended every year higher than when it started. And during that period, you had inflation fears, deflation fears, strong dollar, weak dollar, strong oil, weak oil, political instability, political stability, and gold right. ended up higher. Right. That showed that so many of the mythologies that people were um, assuming um, were not only not true, but because they weren't true, they would give far more underlying support to people buying gold when they realized they weren't true. And I'd seen that in silver. Mm -hmm. I'd seen that in oil. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and in fact, one of the reasons I got out of oil was because I could no longer understand what this newfangled thing called shale was. Right. And when I could no longer quantify it, I didn't know whether oil was worth $100 or worth $20. I still don't, which is why I never returned to it, even though it was you know, my biggest score. Mm -hmm. But in the case of gold, it was very obvious to me we'd had a 12-year bull run. That to me was leg one, from 250 to 1900. Leg two was this correction that we've been experiencing, which to my eyes, not everyone's, was forming this declining wedge. I do this now because it's so funny to yeah, watch you I smile mean, I, like that. So um, and I remember telling you this. Now, yeah. I said, when it breaks out, yeah. it can come back one more time to test it. Now, yeah. the beautiful part about it is that it formed this, and then the subsequent pattern mm. has turned into a saucer. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> do you need to take time? The I think, wedge and the saucer. I think, I think Dan just had a personal uh, moment. <laughs> Can we? Uh, so. <laughs> There are Come on, baby. There are real, Get with it. There are technicians who <laughs> only do this, and and their views are completely pointless. But I, I mean, to hear to hear you talk about it, I mean, I understand exactly what you're saying. Well, let me tell and you I think something. You're right. Let me tell you something. You're still a young man. <laughs> you're cup still and a young. Do you remember cup and handle? You're, you're, I do. <laughs> you're still a young man. So one of the things <laughs> that corroborated my fundamental view on silver in the '90s was that it had formed a perfect saucer, which I didn't know what a saucer bottom was. But Mark Faber, in his Boom, yes. Doom, and Gloom, yeah, referenced Mark. this yeah. saucer bottom for silver and referred to it as a lifetime opportunity. Right. At that time, he was the only individual um, who I could find who was validating my thesis, but he gave another reason for it. And I that's when I started oh, yeah, to decide I need to learn more about this technical analysis. And God yeah. knows yeah. it went from three and a half, ultimately back to 50. So it worked. I, it, worked. it worked. I get it. And so taking that into account, you can have these fluctuations along the way. But my contention is even notwithstanding head fakes, silver is now poised for that third leg. Silver too now. Excuse me, well, gold. Gold. But silver is basically gold on steroids. Right, so right, right, right. Same thing, I just, to touch you know, that one, just but, more yeah. volatile. But it seems to me that gold is embarking on a, essentially a third wave. I'm not speaking about it in Elliott Wave terms, but essentially, <laughs> okay. yes. you know, when no, you no, have a course. decade, no, 12 years up right. and eight, nine years right. down, the right. next one is likely to be 10, right. 15 years. And I believe, purely based on um, how difficult the gold mining industry has become, that we will see an equilibrium range of between three and five thousand dollars. Extrinsic of the macros and the yeah. white and the black swans. Okay, so let's just before we get into the mining, just a little bit on the macro backdrop. Obviously, negative interest rates. We could not, never have thought of that, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. You mean that gold is a high yielding currency? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And interestingly, I mean, gold against a basket of currencies has already broken out, sure. um, especially some of the emerging, of course. And so it's, it has proved to have been a hedge against uh, oh, the debasement of fiat, certainly in, in non-G10 or, not, uh, or emerging, emerging countries. What are some of the other macro things that you uh, are, you think are, are supportive here um, for the gold price break? I think gold is the perfect asset now. You're, I'll come to it from the mining industry standpoint in a moment, but the reason yeah. why I focus on that is because it's that which tells me gold has nowhere else to go but up. The macros are what will ultimately determine whether gold stays within a three to five thousand dollar range or potentially multiplies from there. So yes, there are negative interest rates, um, but the most important aspect about gold is that 
and I think John Hathaway obviously made the same reference, it is the only asset class that isn't someone else's liability. Mm. And the proof of this is that central banks are buyers. The largest since 1967, last year, right? Well, they stopped being buyers after um, Nixon went off the gold standard. Mm -hmm because the thesis was it's just been demonetized. Yeah. And the dollar was able for a long time to um, sustain itself because the dollar was considered as good as gold, because initially the dollar right. was as good as gold because yeah. it was backed by gold. Yeah. I view central banks as being the ultimate insider buyers. They know, as sure as the treasurer of Enron knew that they are engaged in, at best, a confidence game, and at worst, a Ponzi scheme. They know that so much of their own treasuries is filled with duplicable rubbish. You mean treasury bills? Everything. All of it, all the debt. Currencies. Yeah. They want to debase their currencies. Yeah. Everyone wants to debase their currencies. Right. They want to, whether they say it explicitly or not. When everyone wants to debase their currencies and the assets are based on currencies, mm -hmm. ultimately, and the assets can be printed and they know that everyone else wants to be able to find new and exotic ways of doing that, to be able to have an asset that when you own it, you actually own it it isn't somebody else's liability to repay you, is attractive. So at the very least, mm -hmm. you see that central banks who used to be sellers will not sell because they know that their populations um, have a very vocal uh, interest in the gold or the family silver not being sold. You've seen just yesterday, Poland announced that they'd repatriated 100 tons of gold. Yeah. Yeah. And they are very proud of the fact that they've now become the largest holder of gold amongst the Eastern European mm -hmm. countries. Um, but they're not alone. Russia's been buying gold. China's been buying gold. Kazakhstan's been buying gold. They know that to be beholden to things that can be duplicated by fiat means to give away your independence. So the problem with gold is that there's not enough of it. Before we, we move one step into that, it, do, do, it, it strikes me though that this is, this is, um, it's the move away uh, from the unipolar uh, world that it used to be just the United States. I mean, if you think back in 1990 or even 2000 before the rise of China, it was really just the U.S. as as the main economic entity. But then, as everyone else grows in wealth they start to allocate even little bits to you know, different assets. And so it's sort of this very, gold shows you that there is this slow shift moving, uh, spreading out uh, to the world, that it's, there's more of a balance um, even 10 years from now that we'll see. The US will be a country in the world as opposed to just the only country in the world. And I think you see that uh, via gold flows. It's tied, I think, into the historical, uh, into a larger historical vision of where we're going. Right? Now you're talking, singing sweet music to me. No, but I, I um, mean, I would you think are you correct. see it that From way From a as macro well, right? standpoint, if, macro we, if, we, if we superimpose history yeah. onto the geopolitics yeah. of gold, yeah. then there's no question that gold is going to assume more and more of an influence in the emerging countries which are eating away at America's financial preeminence. Very slowly. It's a very slow thing. It's, it's slow not very obvious. There aren't people in the gold space who ever talk about it because everyone is either a miner or a trader or... But you that's know, changing. Yeah, and I should, I should, I should get there, to that. Okay, I should yeah. get to that point because yeah. I think it does, it is, it is a shift that maybe has occurred faster than I expected. But oh. From a historical standpoint, look, so much of America's wealth is predicated on the fact that we have the world's reserve currency. Mm -hmm. It allows us to be profligate and irresponsible um, in a way that we otherwise couldn't accomplish. But 
the underpinning of that preeminence, the underpinning of that prestige, mm -hmm. is a whole group of factors that is being eroded, if not discarded. So while you talk about it being slow, and I would agree, but it's only the size of the gold market that makes it so, but that could change with higher prices. The fact is that those elements that America needs in order to maintain the uh, luxury of having a currency so disproportionately owned relative to its um, trading power um, are being destroyed. I mean, you're the, talking about trust. It's trust and consistency. Mm -hmm. So what makes America different? Well, we have the ability to project power in a unique way right now. Um, we do have the reserve currency, which underpins that. We were, until recently, the firmest supporter of multilateral trading organizations and the principle of free trade. Um, we were the leading exponent of universal values. So there were a lot of soft power aspects that went into making us leaders and unique in terms of the combination of those attributes. When you strip away all of that, you're left with a country that um, has a lot of deficiencies and arguably no longer merits the, um, the luxury of having the world's reserve currency. It has to be, it has to be maintained. You're almost it has to be saying earned. that it's moral, that this is an issue of character. I believe everything is an issue of character, ultimately. So in a way, do you think that the US has abdicated its moral responsibility as the you know, upholder of universal values, truth, etc.? And that's- Ask that's, any Syrian Kurd. Exactly. Well, that's another issue we probably shouldn't- I mean, uh, we, That pretty they, much they, right. epitomizes it. Right. Well, um, I was writing a piece uh, on that subject which was published in the Washington Post called The American Munich, because I literally couldn't find another less cliche um, example of betrayal. And if I were an ally of the United States, whether in Western Europe or the Middle East or in Asia, um, I'd be rethinking it. I mean, look at the Kurds. Right. So. And so you think that in a way also, historically, that's what's underpinned the dollar. Um, but also now that there isn't a clear uh, leader that a lot of the countries around the world feel like they, they need to have more gold? Is that, I'm linking it back to the increase in the central bank buying by all these various countries. So do you think there's a connection there? Can we connect the historical with the moral to the economic? You can, but I think let's connect it first to the philosophy. Our corporate motto is, Intelligence is a commodity. Character is a currency. The origin of that expression was a conversation that I was having with a fund manager who was telling me that he didn't need exposure to gold because he had exposure to oil. And they were the same thing, essentially, commodities. Oh, yeah. And I told him, well, that's not true. I said, oil is a commodity. I know energy very well, and um, it is like intelligence. You can buy it, you can sell it. Universities churn out millions of intelligent people every year. And there are other intelligent people who don't go to universities, but the point is that you can buy the most highly rated investment banker or lawyer or accountant, brilliant people, but you can't buy character. And that to me is the difference between oil and gold. Intelligence is plentiful, gold is truly rare. Mm -hmm. And that's why they have to be viewed as very, very different items. Remember, um, when we go back to discussions of myths, I remember dollar euro was 147 when we got a wire transfer from our partner in Canada buying out Lior Energy. 
147. Gold was at 650. Mm -hmm. Gold is more than doubled, despite the fact that the dollar has strengthened. Oil was over 100. Mm -hmm. I don't have to tell you where oil is versus where gold is. Once again, the mythology that you need a weak dollar or you need uh, strong commodities for gold to prosper, they're wrong. When people truly understand that, they will understand that the supply demand dynamic of gold is one that will take it inexorably higher. Before we get into that, uh, there's one last question I wanna ask you about. You said the fund manager. The institutional allocation to gold is de minimis. The fund manager who said oil is like gold, gold, they have a commodity index. When, if ever, will the institutions uh, move into gold? Um, I, I think even a one to 2% move would double the gold price. I mean, if you talk about global institutions, family offices, pensions, et cetera. 1% would do it. 1% would do it. So what's the, what's the hesitation? Gold is the asset that people love to hate and hate to love. Okay. It goes back to a misreading of John Maynard Keynes's comment that gold is a barbarous relic. Even he said um, it may be a barbarous relic, but it is a reference point for a lot of people, and therefore it needs to be part of a basket that has to do with financial assets. But it's not in that basket today. No, it's not. I mean, not in any meaningful quantity, and that's what makes what's happened over the last six months so exciting for me. A year ago, if a fund manager were to be constructive on the price of gold on CNBC, um, they would have been ridiculed as a troglodyte, cave dweller, maybe a tree dweller, but they certainly would not have had a good reception. That's changing. Not that the reception is warm, but it's no longer viewed as being um, something that gets you tagged as an insect or a gold bug. What's changed, and this is a very pleasant surprise for me, is that a number of very serious bold-faced names have come out in favor of gold. Ray Dalio has been there for several years now, but he's made a hyper-rational case for gold that I would recommend that anyone look into. But relatively recently in the summer, you had Paul Tudor Jones, who admittedly is a trader, but sees gold as being the best trade of the year. Um, Jeff Gundlach, who has rightly been bullish on gold, mm -hmm. sort of described it as a coiling snake, which may now be unfurling. Mark Mobius, whose expertise is the emerging markets, apropos the fact that um, the East mm -hmm. uh, is buying gold, something that was recommended by a Harvard professor named Ken Rogoff. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is yeah. you're now starting to get people talk about gold in a way that they would have been derided before. Now, maybe not because they're bold-faced names, but I've noticed more and more a fund manager is able to say he's looking at gold. I did not expect that to happen until gold surpassed the old highs. The fact that we're now starting to see a revalidation of gold as being something that a prudent man can invest in right. is important. Now, remember, the whole prudent man rule was initially created in order to be able to weigh the relative risk of assets against what was ultimately considered the safest asset, gold. We went then so far away from that that it became imprudent to own gold. Now we're starting to see that pendulum swing back. Now you could say, well, you're starting to see a, uh, more of a concentration of bullishness, but remember who's being bullish. This is still the most uncrowded trade in the financial world. But the fact that people can look at it now in a different way without fear that if they go to their IC, 
they'll be immediately ejected out the window, maybe out the door, but not out the window, well, is a very yeah. good sign well, let, let for me, those who believe that gold will gather momentum. Yeah, let me add one caveat to that, because I had been thinking about this, but Mobius is emerging markets, Gunlock is bonds, Dalio is an asset allocator who's basically long equity, and Tudor is pure macro and trader. So it's where they're coming from not just who they are. And I think that, that that is something new. That's something new from all perspectives. Very rare to have a bond guy come out so strongly for gold, but that's obviously because the rates are so low. Um, and bonds are in a way derating uh, a bit as an asset class. So anything else? So well, that's, I think for that's that very reason. important. That, that, that yeah. shouldn't be a surprise to you. It's for that reason yeah. that I said that yeah. from a macro standpoint, I think that gold is the perfect financial asset. And a great deal of that has to do with the reality that you can have investors with very different points of view, mm -hmm. very different rationales for why they want an allocation to gold. But nonetheless, it's almost as if all roads lead to some gold ownership. A 1% allocation would probably take gold into that three to 5,000 range. So a gold bull should be extremely encouraged that it provides such a safe haven, not just physically, but such a safe haven intellectually for yeah. smart money to find their own reason. Now, interestingly enough, Sam Zell said that for the first time, he bought gold. Oh, I missed that. Real estate. Mm -hmm. Now real estate. So that's mm -hmm. another... So now, we, now, now Sam's I, I dealing with that. real estate with uh, something underneath it. Mm -hmm. And the reasons that he cited were the supply and demand. Okay, now. <laughs> so now can I thank Sam and, and, and move to... To the, the, the nuts and bolts, the, the yes, the supply demand. And hopefully you touch on something uh, that I actually have called the Kaplan Doctrine. And I've come up with that uh, to describe something which, um, well, well, I'll let you, I'll come back to that. It's the well, jurisdictional issue, ah. which I call the Kaplan Doctrine, but we can address that a little I'll bit. I'll take that one. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take that, that is, one. I, I think that's yours. Primarily because, um, I'll take it because I became one of those evangelicals who saw the light um, after having been in many ways the poster boy for an American uh, investing in intrepid places like Bolivia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Congo, mm -hmm. um, and now um, going to 95% North America and Australia. That is a very important subject. Yeah, I think it may be even the most important, I mean, after Panther, of course, but the most important subject uh, of the day. So do you wanna tell people how you've shifted your portfolio and why, and it's been pretty, pretty dramatic and unique? After having made my bones, as they say um, in the mafia, um, in the developing world. About seven, eight years ago, I came to the conclusion that the era that characterized the period from the time that Newmont Mining went to Peru and partnered with Buenaventura on the Yanacocha mine in the early 90s was over. Up until that time, U.S. assets were valued using 0% discount rates because they were arbitraged against the other countries which were viewed as jurisdictionally risky in the gold space. South Africa, Australia, and Canada. When the industry started to see the success which Newmont had in Yanacocha and in Peru, it began a go where the gold is mantra that took people all throughout South America, um, all throughout Africa, Indonesia, you name it, go where the gold is. In fact, it became so um, 
in verse that the view became a premium should be paid for assets in um, those risky jurisdictions because it was easier to permit the mines. You had less environmental regulations. Mm -hmm. You still had to be at the very highest standard, but nobody was going to sue you. So US assets, Canadian assets, were neglected in favor of the more plentiful gold assets in jurisdictions where they took the attitude, capital is welcome. We've now gone full circle, in my opinion, um, and I've had this argument with others in the industry, but they, at least they can't say I'm simply talking my own book. It's true, I've gone to the last chapter of my book because I wrote that book, and I know it's not pretty. As Woody Allen once said, I'm not afraid of death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. And a while ago, I realized that I was incredibly exposed to the vicissitudes of the emerging markets, places where uh, the rule of law was a novelty, places where I came to understand that when I went to sleep at night, I might not own what I thought I owned when I woke up in the morning. So you went for the gold. You followed oh, the I did. gold. You I, did I, was, I was the poster boy. Right. Um, I was the largest holder of mineral rights in Pakistan when the Department of Defense came to me to become the American champion for um, mining exploration in Afghanistan. Now, I knew well enough to know that I told them, I know how this movie ends. It ends with playing taps. It ends with you guys leaving. <laughs> right. And it ends up with me, if I'm lucky enough to have found anything, with a big hole in the ground, relying on the generosity of the Taliban, no thank you. Right. Right. But the fact was, I was the largest holder of mineral rights in Pakistan. So, you know, as a matter of degree. I came to understand that the likelihood was that I would take these assets up the value chain, if I was lucky enough to find them or take control of interesting assets, and they would effectively be nationalized, either de facto or de jure. Maybe the salami strategy. There are many, many different ways to, to do this. And I just wanted no part of it. Mm -hmm. More than that, when I toured uh, the horizon, a tour d'horizon of uh, the mining industry, I came to think, well, if I'm thinking this way, I'm probably ahead of the curve by a number of years. But what it means is one day, the market will come back to placing the premium valuation on the US assets again let's say US, Canadian, and Mexican, NAFTA, mm -hmm. um, and Australia. Yeah. And so I went from being 50% North America, 50% other, to 90, 95% North America, which is what I am today. And I have no doubt that the market has come around to my point of view. It's very obvious to me that um, when a broker is calling up a fund manager these days and saying, I've got a really interesting management team with a world-class asset, the fund manager is very often saying, that sounds wonderful. I'm happy to see them. Just one question, where in the world are they? Mm -hmm. Because if they're in a place where I have to take a career risk when I go to my IC, or I have to go explain to them that we've lost the mine to political disruption or nationalization or any of a number of factors, they're going to say, why did you invest someplace where you wouldn't be willing to go visit or take your children? Mm -hmm. So seen through that prism, which may sound simplistic, but I think it's going to come down to something akin to that. You want to be in places like Nevada, where depending on your proclivities, you want to go gambling with your wife or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whatever, you want to go to Alaska and go whale watching or salmon fishing. Mm -hmm. um, you want to go swim in the Great Barrier Reef. It makes sense. I don't believe that the first place that fund managers are going to go to look for their exposure to gold are in places where, as I said, the rule of law is a novelty. Do you think it's also connected to the U.S.'s pulling back, as, as we discussed before, as a world leader, that some of these places have become more unstable uh, in the last you know, 10, 15 years? 
You no, I don't believe that that's no on us. There's no connection. No, no, no. I'll blame us. I'll blame us for where I think um, we should shoulder responsibility. But I think it's probably a fair statement that whether it's in the West or the developing world, um, we're dealing with political disequilibrium that is off the charts. So I have one caveat to the Kaplan doctrine. And I think we talked about this uh, even a few weeks ago, and that is that when the price does eventually get to 2,500 or 3,000, that those governments in those places will be confiscating those mines. And so it's not so much, there's risk perhaps today, maybe at 1450, but at 2,500, there's a whole chunk of the world's supply that essentially is not gonna be there. And so in my worldview, I've, that's how I've adapted, not being a miner, uh, how I've adapted that view. And that, in that scenario, it certainly is possible that we could see uh, shortages because we know that uh, governments and especially emerging market governments uh, will not know how to run uh, these mines. And so it's sort of a, more of a forward looking view that at that price, the supply that we think we have won't be there. I salute your foresight. Okay. <laughs> um, I try not to go there because the implications for yeah. my brethren within the, uh, within the industry is not a very good one. Right, right. But the implications for investors becomes a very interesting one. From a macro standpoint, as you say, um, the inevitable uh, mismanagement of those assets, certainly the absence of reinvestment in those assets, means that from a macro standpoint, from a supply-demand standpoint, um, it's likely to exacerbate what I already see as being um, a disequilibrium just simply from production falling off naturally. The other aspect that has to be considered is this. You're a bull on gold, and you make that decision to express that bullishness um, by buying gold equities, gold-related assets. How sad would it be if gold goes to 3,000, and in your scenario, the uh, Tapiero corollary <laughs> to the Kaplan doctrine. Come on. Um, uh, no, I want you to get the blame for this. Um, I, this, this, this I'm is not in the industry, so I, exactly you know, I, that, 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 that makes guy. it more, even yeah. more e easy to yeah. pillory you. Yeah. Um, but here's what happens in that scenario: gold goes to three thousand, and the guy who actually got it right on the macro, yeah. at least from the standpoint of knowing that gold was going up, although he didn't think it through to what you're talking about, gets the asset taken away from him. That's <clears throat> the worst possible outcome, which is why my mantra as I developed in my career was always um, go for the great assets that give you tremendous underlying leverage to your theme, whether it's silver, platinum, hydrocarbons, or gold. But then I adopted a twist to that, which is go for those assets that will give you the leverage, but only in jurisdictions that will allow you to keep the fruits of the leverage when it comes time to ring the cash register. And the reason I can talk about all these wonderful things with you is not simply because of things that I bought or found, it's that there does come a time when I say it's time to leave. And I believe that being able to sell well is a lot harder than buying well mm -hmm. because of the psychology of the moment. If you are immune to people's fear and you're buying when the blood is running in the streets, as Rothschild said, um, then it's actually not very difficult. However, it's extremely difficult to resist the euphoria when people believe that you're right and are now giving you stock tips. Okay, but this is the cart before the horse because you're selling, let's talk a little bit about how you've expressed your view on gold. 
Historically, I've expressed my view on natural resources through natural resources assets, through what we like to call category killers. Mm -hmm. And I've been blessed to be able to have found or taken control of um, some of the best assets in different spheres of the resources sector. But as great as they were, there was one asset that I always coveted. And it's an interesting story, and that's the story of our engagement with Nova Gold, which is our flagship in the gold space, and for me, the very best way to express my view. And by the way, if I didn't feel it, I'd sell it. I'd put the company into play, or I would sell our stake um, and move on to something that was better. There isn't any better story in the gold development space in the world, not even in Russia, and yet it is located in the second largest gold producing state in the safest jurisdiction in the world, in the United States, in Alaska. I started to watch Nova Gold uh, in the early 2000s when it was a 50 cent dollar stock oh. hmm. as a consequence of uh, discoveries at Donlan Creek Mm -hmm. The stock multiplied many-fold. I didn't own it, but I just watched it. I was fascinated by how this was unfolding. But not yet um, obsessive about U.S. assets. I still, I wasn't in that phase yet. Barrick, in 2006, after absorbing or taking over Placer Dome, made a hostile bid for Nova Gold, $14, $15, $16. Um, the shareholders, of which I wasn't one, rejected it, and the stock went into the 20s, which is definitely where I have no doubt it's going back, probably significantly higher. In any event, I was watching this, and I saw that the company was making a number of mistakes, the self-inflicted wounds that caused the stock to collapse from the 20s all the way back down in a round trip to a buck, even below. Very, so what year, what year are we talking now? 2007, 2008. 2008. Okay. And towards the end of 2008, I made the decision to go for it. I was sitting with a lot of cash, only conviction about gold, and I had come to believe for a variety of reasons by that time, that this was the greatest gold asset in the space. 50% owned by Nova Gold, 50% owned by Barrick. On December 31st, 2008, which was a time when, to the extent that anybody in this business was celebrating, it was a difficult time for the world in general. Only the uh, global macro um, fund managers, right? Exactly. We made a move yeah. on Nova Gold and effectively did a take under. And I bought as much as I could, um, I had the ability to write an $80 million check to save the company from bankruptcy um, and to buy shares in the open market. And eventually we had to stop because we were allowed to, uh, to do the take under, but the Ontario Securities Exchange, oh. if you, it, make a takeover attempt if you want to go further. We'd saved the company from bankruptcy, so there were exigent circumstances. The reason I didn't buy the whole thing hmm. was because uh, wiser voices prevailed in my office and um, believing very strongly that even in triumph, uh, the Caesar has to be told, thou art mortal. Um, and the president of the Electrum Group, Igor Leventhal, was whispering into my ear, remember, you are mortal. If you go after this and try to buy the whole company at $2, even though Barrick is asleep, they will walk you up dollar for dollar until yeah. at a certain point, even you will throw in the towel. Better to own 40% of something wonderful. That's greedy enough. Don't be stupid greedy. Well, and it was so great advice. expertise too. I mean, having a partner of that caliber um, certainly is helpful uh, at some point, I would think. Well, they were going to be a partner, but the point that he was making was that having mm -hmm. already tried to buy Nova Gold um, when the stock was oh, in the I teens, right. the I chance see. that they would let me absorb all of it yeah. were a lot lower than allowing me to be a white knight just because of the exigencies okay, of the time. Understood. Had it been different, yeah. Barrick, Newmont, a few others were waiting for the company to go bankrupt because the company at that time um, was like 
from a financial standpoint, a falling knife. They had class action lawsuits. Uh, the management was discredited, no balance sheet, environmental issues mm -hmm. um, with the EPA on an asset that we subsequently disposed of, bad relations with Barrick. Uh, their asset with uh, tech called Galore had been a blowout. Nobody institutionally was willing to touch it. But um, to us, it looked like a great opportunity. We loved the Donlin story. And I sent my chief geologist out after we did the deal. I gave my team 48 hours to do the due diligence. And they said, it's impossible to do due diligence in 48 hours. And I said, let me give you the parable of the runners and the bear. Two hikers are in the woods. They come across a bear. One skedaddles and the other one leans over and very casually exchanges his hiking boots for sneakers. The one who's running says, what are you doing? And he said, you have to understand, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. Hmm. I said, I don't have to believe what Novogold says about the asset. I just have to believe that Barrick won't lie in their disclosures. That's all I need right. to know. They're and actually, of course yeah. they didn't. Because and Barrick so far, you, you, you haven't mentioned that. The Donlin mine is the largest single uh, gold deposit in the world. Is that correct? The attributes yeah. of Donlin yeah. in the aggregate make it unique. Right. First of all, there's never been a gold mine which began with 40 million ounces. Okay, that's what it um, is. And that 40 million ounces is drawn from only three kilometers of an eight kilometer mineralized belt. So the likelihood of significant expansion. There's more than 5 million ounces in the immediate pit that a few more drill holes would put into the same higher category is very high. Moreover, that eight kilometers is only on less than 5% of the total land package. Oh boy. So Donlin has the attributes of size and scale and exploration potential. Mm -hmm. But more than that, in the last 10 years that we've owned our share in Donlin, the um, grade of the average gold mine has plunged by upwards of half. Mm. And the cost of a gold mine is very much a function of grade. Ceteris paribus, if all the other operating costs are the same, if you have a grade of two grams and someone else's grade is a gram, your cost of production per ounce is half of theirs. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're dealing with an average grade of greater than two grams, two, two and a half grams, perhaps higher, we'll see, um, is enormous as a relative advantage. So it has size, it has quantity, and it has quality, which also means the operating costs will be amongst the lowest in the business. So what this will be is, in one or two phases, the largest single pure gold producing mine in the world. I say pure gold because I believe Freeport's uh, Grossberg mine, um, which is gold and copper, may produce some more gold. But in terms of pure gold, without any of the base metals, which is very important to us because it gives us that economic autonomy, um, it's unique in the world. But most importantly, it's not located in difficult parts of the world. Right. It's located in a place where private property is sacred. We have wonderful pro uh, partners on the ground. So for me, when I look at all of these attributes, I believe that Donlin, unlike other assets that we've had, which have been great, is actually unique. And it is far and away for us, the best way to play the gold space. And my guess is, and if you look at our shareholder base, you'll see it's unusually strong. Fidelity and John Paulson and First Eagle, the Agnellis, uh, et cetera. When you, when you look at the kind of money that is in the story, they understand that what they're dealing with is the greatest unexpiring option on gold in the world. And this is very good for us because it makes us a pure play on essentially the next Nevada. And it's great for Barrick. But are you saying that you think this is a higher quality bet investment than your previous three or four big hits? Yes. 
This is uh, really I hadn't, yeah. I hadn't I hadn't known that. Yeah, this is. Um, oh boy, this isn't this this is a, a Rembrandt, a Vermeer, a Da Vinci. Okay. Um, be, because it's unique. It's the perfect asset There's in the perfect one. place. There's right. no fund manager who ultimately wouldn't want a piece of this, either by buying us as a pure play, or if they want production um, and diversified portfolio, Barrick. You know, Barrick is now run by Mark Bristow, who I call the white swan, um, because for the first time, Barrick has um, a CEO in the 11 years mm. that I've been dealing with the company. And there've been times when our relations have been excellent. I mean, we've always been a very loyal partner to Barrick, which has undergone a lot of stresses and strains, but the advent of the Randgold acquisition, mm -hmm. um, either by or of Barrick, is a very, very good piece of news for us because our belief is that um, they see the value in the story, and whether they sold it to someone who wants to adopt our narrative or they want to uh, develop it when gold prices are higher, we're not in a rush. I believe, like Jesse Livermore says or said, you make more money by sitting than by doing. We've taken things up the value chain. We now have what will be the biggest gold mine in the world, in the safest jurisdiction with federal permits and with the support of the Alaska government and the native corporations who are our partners. All we have to do is not do anything stupid. And we haven't done anything stupid in the last 11 years, and we've kept all our promises. So, so long as we keep doing that, yeah. I genuinely believe that we will multiply just by virtue of the fact that when people start to look for gold assets, you're going to see a disproportionate share channel itself into those very few mm -hmm. high quality North American and Australian assets and it'll be like getting Hoover Dam through a garden hose. And in right, fact, you may end up seeing a bubble in those kinds of things. So, so in the sitting, what kind of time frame? and I know you've been, as you said, invested 11 years. Are we talking another 10 years? Are we five to 10? Clearly, there's no reason to make, uh, 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 have a view that it's one or two years. It's, uh, that's pointless, but is it, is it 20 years or in is terms it five? Of when in terms of you see the, the realization, yeah. Um, well, I mean, tell me what the gold know. price will be. Well, um, I mean, if I had to, but it's if a, I had it's to a, game a, this out, yeah, yeah. We are now in the last phase of the bottoming process of gold's um, correction within the secular bull market. Mm. As gold takes off, there will definitely be more interest in the gold space. And my guess is that uh, the assets which are the safest um, and where the management has shown itself yeah. to be qualified will be amongst the go-to stocks in the space. There really aren't that so many. Can I say five years, 10 years? Could it be six matter. months. Could be. It could be five years. Could be. Tell me what the gold price right. is. Right. I don't think it's in Barrick's interest to, yeah. uh, to do anything other than do what we're doing together, which is taking it up the value chain, doing all the studies that we need. Um, I think their mantra is the same as ours. It's the best option on the gold price. That works for me because I've always had an aversion to building things at prices which I think are too low in order to subsidize Indian and Chinese consumption. Right. Uh, I just think it's a very bad business model and I don't think it makes sense. Um, people think that production is the way you make money. It's not, it's selling something at a high price. That's how you make money. Right. And in the case of Donlin, the leverage that we have at $1,900 gold, Donlin, has an NPV of $20 billion split two ways. You know, that puts us in the 30s and that adds dollars per share to Barrick. So this is a good thing. And if mm -hmm. you think that 1900 is barely a, uh, a border um, between where we're really going, then the most important thing is to husband the asset, treat it well, yeah. don't do anything silly. 
and then take it into production when prices are high enough to give the shareholders a killing. Now, obviously, the share price, you know, we did our last offering at nine and a half dollars in 2012 when Greg Lang, the CEO of Nova Gold, um, came on board from Barrick, where he was the president of Barrick Gold North America. And he'd been there for eight years. He'd been with Barrick and its predecessor companies for 30 years. He said, you come on board as chairman, I'm coming on board as CEO. I said, you come on board as CEO, I'll come on board as chairman. And it's been a love fest ever since. But one of the first things that happened is we went on what was meant to be an informational road show. And it wasn't a good time for mining equities, but $500 million in demand emerged. And our bankers, J.P. Morgan mm -hmm. um, and RBC, called us up and said, you know, are you willing to do a deal? And we raised $330 million at $9.5 a share. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look back on my track record in public companies, I don't do down rounds. So anyone looking at this can know that we're not going to be doing a round lower than that. And the likelihood is gold will go up, we'll go through the nine and a half, back to the 15, where we were in 2010. And then my guess is we go into the 20s, which was the all-time high of the company. That's my scenario. And at that point, we can decide whether we want to raise equity for um, building the mine. We'll see where we are in terms of how we see it as being one or two phases. Now, the reason why I can be so remarkably complacent about this is that we don't need money. We're one of the only companies in the space that is sitting on between cash on hand of $150 million and another $100 million in bankable receivables from New month for the sale of Galore, mm -hmm. we have almost a quarter of a billion dollars worth of cash and receivables at a time when we have a permitted mine and the money is just being spent on additional studies to optimize it. So from my standpoint, it's the perfect story for the gold space. It's the best option, the safest option, and it's an option on what is likely to be only a fraction of the true asset base, because my chief geologist who found San Cristobal believes that there's another Donlin to be found at Donlin. So... Right, you wrote that in, the, uh, in your uh, um, chairman's letter. The next Donlin is, is at Donlin. Maybe that's a great place to, to cut it off and let people dream about that. 